Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the panel is Liquid Dreams, the fantasy of selling out and getting cash. <laughs> so we're going to start uh, this whole track uh, with a little bit non-traditional exits. Um, and the context here is you know, startups are staying private longer and longer, uh, but the exit environment is really challenging, right? With M&A sort of being slow, especially like in the private market space, IPO market sort of drying up. Um, so how do founders, VCs, and LPs create liquidity for themselves? And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so just quick introduction with me on the panel. Uh, Shri Basham is a co-founder and general counsel of Equity Zen, a marketplace for investing in private companies. Equity Zen is also a batch seven company at 500, so. That's right, 500 strong. 500 strong, all right. Um, Justin Fishnell Wolfson is co-founder and managing partner of at 137 Ventures. 137 Ventures manages over uh, 450 million. Is that right, Justin? I think it's 500. 500, okay. Um, uh, that includes a recent 200 million new round, so congratulations. Um, and 137 provides employees and founders liquidity through loans against private company stock. Um, Hans Wildens is the CEO and founder of Industry Ventures. Industry Ventures manages over $2.7 billion, uh, including a re recently raised new $700 million fund, congratulations, uh, and purchases equity from VCs, startups, and limited partners. Um, welcome. Uh, so let's, let's talk about how this works. Um, I thought it'd be helpful for each of you to just tell everyone a little bit about uh, your firm and uh, how you guys operate. So, you know, who your target counterparties are, average check size, uh, typical deal profile. Um, you want to start? Sure. So, <clears throat> Equity Zen is a platform for liquidity and private investments. On one side, we have uh, shareholders in um, private companies. Typically, these are employees, ex employees, founders, and early investors who are looking for liquidity uh, for real life needs such as putting a down payment on a home or um, paying off their school debt or it could be that they're an angel investor and they've hit their IRR targets and want to redeploy uh, some of those um, some of those proceeds and on the other side you have investors who have typically been boxed out of access to this asset class because their check size is not big enough to be an LP in many of the funds that are making these direct investments. These are typically high net worth individuals, family offices, and other institutions that are looking for access to this asset class. And we help them along with other players in the ecosystem, such as brokers that are out there trying to facilitate these deals uh, to come together and find a way to make these deals happen a little bit more efficiently. Okay, so we'll go down in order. So uh, just to understand the, the ecosystem a bit, you know, what Equity Zen is trying to do, they're, they're trying to build a marketplace, right? Then there are folks that are brokers and folks like that that are really, they're, they're middlemen, they're, they're transactions, and so they don't, they don't actually have capital. Can you hear me? Is my mic on at all? Can you guys hear? Uh, yep. Can you hear me now? That's slightly better? All right. So, it, you know, where we sit in the ecosystem, we, we have a fund, so we have capital, and we're generally investing in later stage companies high-pitched frequency, uh, that, that are still growing really quickly. And as you pointed out, Mike, part of the problem is companies are taking a really long time to get liquidity, and the time scale of people and the time scale of capital is very different. And if you, you know, started a company when you are 25 and now you're 33, maybe you're married, maybe you have kids, maybe you don't want to live with roommates. So you know, the, we're, we're really helping to address that problem for founders and executives and early employees. Yeah, Hans Wildens uh, from Industry Ventures. We, uh, we give liquidity to all the constituents in the market, um, both shareholders and companies, as well as investors and funds. Uh, and we help companies um, with liquidity issues and their employees or their founders or ex-founders or sometimes ex-management team members, as well as uh, the funds. Uh, so we work with the venture funds. and provide liquidity to their LPs and buy out LPs in the funds and also provide liquidity to the funds at the end of their life or during the investment period to give the funds some, some cash back as well. What's your check size, Hans, typical check size? Uh, we'll invest anything as low as a million dollars up to a hundred million dollars in a transaction. Mm -hmm. And primarily through, uh, you interact with VCs. How should a VC think about interacting with um, 
industry? At what stage? Well, it depends on what type yeah. of VC you are. Um, mm -hmm. Angel investment VCs. We we have a fund of funds as well that um, has forty small venture funds in it that do seed and angel investing. Yeah. Um, so the the plat we really have an investment platform for the venture business. The secondary funds, out of liquidity funds, we also have a fund of funds which invest into venture funds and then also co-invest into companies. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot that we're doing through the ecosystem. Um, but if you're a venture capitalist, uh, we can you know be your limited partner. Yep. And fund your new fund. We'll create funds too with people, as well as we'll buy LPs out of the fund. Yep. Um, and then if once they're on the board of a company, we'll work with the management team and CEOs and the founders to provide liquidity to the company too. So it's all one big circle. Gotcha. We'll find out. All right. Okay. So it, if, if I'm a VC and uh, you purchase my portfolio, uh, does that, how does that work for the, the startups? Are you now on the cap table and do you assume the board seats and all those rights? So if you're a venture capitalist and you're yeah. an active venture capitalist and mm -hmm. you still want to be a venture capitalist, mm -hmm. um, you'll continue to manage the portfolio and we're just the capital behind uh, the, the individual or team. Uh, so I, in about 50% of all of our invested capital is in, into the funds and um, you won't see us because we own the funds, right? And so we're the limited partner or sometimes the sole limited partner in the fund mm -hmm. um, and just own the fund. The manager, right, will be, it'd be like if we owned 500 startups fund one or fund two and bought out the whole fund. Yeah. You would never know if you're the entrepreneur right? because, you know, 500 startups is still the interface, right? The, yeah. the team managing the fund. Yeah. Um, so we, we have a hybrid approach where we both are operating as a limited as well as a, uh, a direct investor when we, when we buy equity in the companies. Got it. And, and Justin, um, when you talk about structured loans for founders and employees to get some liquidity, um, I also saw you guys were in Hyperloop One's recent round um, when they raised 80 million. So how, how do you guys typically get involved uh, in these investment opportunities? Sure, so yeah. I mean, Hyperloop's just the standard sure. exception to every rule. Yeah. You know, you could throw SpaceX into that category as well. So, you know, some things are the exception, but when you look at what our core focus is, you know, it's primarily secondaries. We deal a lot with the individual shareholders. So, you know, Hans, Hans is talking about, you know, dealing with limited partners, funds, sort of a different part of the ecosystem. And you know, one of the things that we do is we just, we do a lot of structured deals. And so one of the primary things is loans. Uh, that kind of came about because I had a lot of friends who were at Facebook many years ago who, you know, they got caught in this tax situation that I think, you know, some or a lot of people here have probably experienced where when you exercise stock options, you end up getting a really large tax bill that you have to pay to the government and you didn't have any money, right? That's a good problem to have because it means you have something to value and it's a bad problem because the government still wants their money. That, that led me to go look around and see if there were anyone who would lend out money in the ecosystem, and it just turned out that none of the folks that I tried to go find would do that, and so we kind of slipped into that part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So what's the typical loan amount that you cut, and do, do you need the company to say yes for every deal? Uh, yeah, I mean, technically, mm -hmm. the answer just depends on the stockholder agreements, but the short answer is like all our deals end up getting approved by the company because we want to be, we want to be partners with the company, and we want to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. Um, yeah. Broadly speaking, everyone has implemented pretty strong shareholder restrictions. Yeah. Uh, so for the most part, you, you do need the company to sign off on it. And the way that you, know, the way that you end up doing this on, in terms of dollar sizes, you know, we're doing anything from a couple million dollars up to you know, 10 or 20 million. Mm -hmm. And what are the loan terms typically, like interest rate, repayment period? Uh, I mean, usually these things are multi-year sorts of mm -hmm. loans because the expectation is that that you're waiting to a point where you can ultimately get liquidity. Yep. So things, you know, three, four years uh, makes the most sense. And interest rate really isn't the major factor for this stuff because ultimately mm -hmm. you're taking equity risk. And so we're looking for equity return. So it's not really an interest rate driven investment. Got it. So kind of like venture debt or at least. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can look at, at it. In, it's, it, there's, yeah. it shares certain similarities to venture debt. I mean, yeah. when you go look at like a WTI, yeah. they're not, they're, they're not, they're making the money on the interest rates. They're making it on the, on, on the equity yeah. coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Uh, Shri, on, with Equity Zen, uh, can you share a little bit more about how big the marketplace is? Um, as an investor, what's the minimum investment amount? 
And if I hop on Equity Zen, what kind of uh, companies stock can I buy today? Sure. Um, Sure. So, you know, on Equities N, um, on the buyer side, the investor side of the marketplace, we have over 11,000 accredited investors. These are high net worth individuals, uh, family offices, and other institutions. And the, uh, the minimum check size is 20K. The average tends to be right around 20K. And our deal size, the sweet spot, tends to be about 250K to about 2.5 million. And we do have deals that go lower than that and bigger than that as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're really uh, driven by two factors. One is being technology enabled, which allows us to do smaller deals at a profit and do more deals simultaneously. Um, you know, I think a large part of this market is, is uh, ignored because you know, some of these smaller deals don't move the needle. And you know, folks like 137 are doing a great job in helping to provide liquidity kind of all across the cap table. And we're hoping to contribute to that as well. Um, and then additionally, uh, like, like 137 and certainly with uh, industry, um, everything we do is with company blessing and company buy-in. We think the only way to make this market work um, and develop kind of broad and deep secondary markets is to account for the issuer of the securities being transacted as a stakeholder in the whole process. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, what, what are some of the companies implementing you know, share buyback programs through equities end today? Can you give us some examples? Sure. So, you know, we can't, um, as a matter of policy, kind of disclose particular company names in terms of companies we've transacted in or mm -hmm. deals that are in progress. But the general profile is a company that has raised, call it, north of $50 million mm -hmm. uh, from the top quartile of VCs um, and is generating revenues and is on an exit path of about one to five years. Typically, these companies have market capitalizations of $500 million and above. Mm -hmm. Got it. Let's talk about the secondary market a little bit. Um, Hans, uh, a lot of us became familiar with secondaries when Facebook IPO'd. In pre-IPO days, it was kind of the wild, wild west with uh, thousands of Facebook employees trying to sell their stock through, I think it was second market. Um, second market, not shares post, second market. Um, how has the secondary market evolved since those days? It's interesting. Uh, so I started doing secondaries in 2001. Um, so a lot more before that. But I think um, when Facebook had their liquidity issues, it, it spawned, it really made this market grow a lot more because it became uh, an item that people talked about at the board level. They didn't do that as much before uh, in terms of shareholder liquidity, employee liquidity, founder liquidity, um, up until about, oh, kind of four or five, I would say, the venture business kind of rejected um, that, that at the board level in terms of they didn't want the founder to sell anything, they didn't want to have the employees sell anything. And so when Facebook finally came out and said, hey, we're letting everybody sell, we have a process, we have a program, this is approved, our board approved it, everybody's approved it, it's great, isn't this a great thing for the employees and everything, um, which it was, uh, that really, changed the uh, sentiment in the market around liquidity for, for, for the equity in the companies. Um, funny enough, the, the fund managers, the VCs, um, always had um, transactions happening in their funds and they always handled them really well in terms of letting people transfer and then making sure that they get transferred to the right hands. Um, so I'm kind of scratching my head of why, you know, Facebook was, had to be the event, but in retrospect, it was, and and uh, and then the company side of the market became more accepted. Well, so let me add on to that. So, I, I was close to the Facebook, uh, let's call it a giant mess. So, I, I mean, ultimately, I think Facebook changed the market because it was the first company that everybody knew, and there were lots of people who wanted to own that stock, even without any information, and that was really the first time, at least in a very long time, where it was a company that was still private, that was so big and so well known, it really, even outside the Valley, right? There were tens of thousands of people who were interested in buying Facebook stock. And never before had the Valley seen that sort of dynamic because the previous restrictions had all been a right of first refusal, which simply said that if you try to sell your shares, the company has the right to buy the back first, right? Which is nice and that's a fine restriction, but Facebook got so big so fast that 
it, it, that, that no longer really provided a, a restriction on the market, and they had, I don't know, half a dozen lawyers literally just processing transactions at all times. It was, mm. it was crazy. So what happened to those guys? Um, as I understand, the leaders in this market back in the day, second market, shares post, they had some, I think they identified a real need, right, which is people wanted to get liquidity, um, but they also hit, hit upon some problems. Uh, you know, companies didn't like the fact that they had a lot of people on a cap table that they couldn't control. I mean, one of the major benefits of being a yeah. private company is that you get to control your cap table, right? You get to choose who your investors are. Yeah. And so what Shares Post and Second Market discovered was that people did need liquidity, but companies didn't want to lose control of the cap table, and it created lots of issues for companies, whether or not it was the shareholder count that ultimately forced Facebook to go public, and then that ultimately was changed by the Jobs Act, or you know, whether or not you want competitors to potentially be on your cap table, or, uh, you know, if you're a company like SpaceX, maybe you have certain restrictions about foreign ownership. Like, you don't want to lose control of your cap table. And that's a, that's a really big problem that those companies ignored. Yep. While absolutely discovering that there's a massive need for liquidity for lots of people. So, Shri, how, how are you guys doing things differently from those guys sure. today? Sure. So, yeah. you know, we kind of looked at what happened in that in those days, secondaries 1.0, as we like to call it, and used it as a case study for how to build this business right. Ultimately, we think that uh, second market kind of shied away from this business a little bit too early um, for reasons we can get into. But the second thing I want to add, in addition to controlling the cap table that companies care about, is controlling the flow of information. Um, so the way that we've approached this, as I mentioned, is you know wanting you know taking into account the company's interests in all of this um, as a stakeholder and proceeding that way. Um, at the end of the day, I think there's a sea change that's happening, and if companies want to indefinitely raise capital from the private markets and defer uh, going public, um, you know longer and longer, they're going to have to confront these liquidity issues. So what you saw kind of in the wake of the Facebook IPO, which I agree with. Justin, it was a mess, was companies retrenched a little bit, the pendulum swung, and you know, some may say it swung a little bit too far the other way, yep. where some companies started um, you know, putting more owner's transfer restrictions in place. We think that's a little bit short-sighted, and we've actually seen that kind of peel off a little bit. We've looked at over 150 different companies' unique transfer restrictions, yep. and looking at that, we found that about 70% of them have what we call market transfer restrictions, what Justin mentioned, which are just a right of first refusal for a 30-day period, maybe an opinion requirement, mm -hmm. but certainly not a blanket approval right. right. And only about 20% of companies So you guys are making it that. better for companies, taking away some of the pain? Yeah, the idea yeah. is, you know, there's a lot of overhead that goes into it, but there's a retention and morale value in providing controlled liquidity along sure. the way. Sure. So we try to help strike that balance. Awesome. Um, I want to be conscious of time. I know we have a couple of minutes left, so just want to take maybe one or two questions from the floor. Anybody? Hi, uh, you're saying that an industry venture is, I'm sorry, but your name? Hans. Todd, you buy out. Todd works too. <laughs> Hans, Hans, sorry. Uh, that how do like LPs or whatever contact you say I have equity in a fund or something I want to get out of is well, a lot of this business is relationship driven and is based on trust and it's based on um, your relationships with the people in the business, right? Both the founders and the companies, the CEOs, the CFOs, as well as the general partners. And so a lot of it's referral based um, and it's based on your reputation. It's based on your you know, capital base. It's based on how you handle yourself in a transaction and whether you have repeat customers or not, right? Uh, just like any business. Um, so on the, on the GP side of the business, um, it's all about uh, you know, having a great investor that can be with them for the long haul and also work with them across multiple funds, uh, have a capital base to look at their next fund if they raise their next fund and if it makes sense, invest in that, um, as well as work, work in their companies to help this liquidity problem. Um, and we've seen more and more of the venture funds and the GPs at the funds get more involved in this liquidity problem over the last eight years. So, you know, we've evolved our firm a little bit to embrace Is this that. a good time for you guys with public markets sort of being very choppy? Um, is this like opportunity time for you guys or you, do you guys follow the public market sentiment? These guys must love it. Uh, I mean, in all honesty, I, I don't, I, I think, you know, we are, and I suspect everyone else are, is that it's a long-term business and so, 
what I care about is are the fundamentals of the businesses that we've invested in continuing to do well? And broadly speaking across our portfolio, the answer to that is yes. So whatever happens in public markets, you, you know, look, ultimately you have comps and that changes valuation numbers and whatnot, but the question is are you investing in really great businesses that have good long-term fundamentals? And if the answer to that is yes, then I'm happy. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you to our panelists. Um, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you.